Well, good morning to all of you. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to begin reading there in just one second. While you're turning there, I want to say thank you for being here. It is just so wonderful to be with so many people who share the faith that I share. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for your confession of the Christ and the way that you serve Him in your life. And thank you for your attention. Uh, It's always a privilege to be able to stand up here and try to share something that I've learned with all of you. Thank you for being so kind. One of the things that I think is amazing about God and about the Bible, about Christianity, is that becoming a Christian is not a complicated process. That's, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? You know, you remember Naaman the leper in, uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 5. Oh, is that 2 Kings chapter 5? One of those two. This isn't in my notes. Uh, but he was the leper who thought that to be cleansed of his leprosy, he had to do some great thing. And he was shocked that all he had to do was be washed in the Jordan seven times. And that's kind of the way it works with becoming a Christian. It's really not that complicated. It's not as hard as you might think. Peter lays that out for us pretty clearly in Acts 2 and verse 38. Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the way to be saved by Jesus. Despite what men may say and what other teachers may teach and other denominations throughout the world, this is the only way to be saved by the blood of Jesus. We believe in Him. We repent of our sins, and then we are baptized in his name to wash those sins away. That is all it takes to be saved by Jesus. Again, it is not a complicated process. But then our life in Christ begins. That's really where our journey starts. And so does the process of spiritual growth and spiritual development. And that process... That can be a little complicated, a little daunting, a little overwhelming, can it? Consider what Jesus says when he offers the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, he tells the apostles, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus says, what I want you to do is I want you to go out and I want you to make disciples. And here's how you make disciples. You baptize them in my name for the forgiveness of their sins, and then teach them everything I have always commanded you. Now, if you're anything like me, you listen to that and you think, well, that's, that's a tall task. I mean, Jesus taught a lot during his time on earth. Teach them everything that I've commanded you. Sometimes if you're anything like me, you look at spiritual growth, spiritual development, and you feel a little overwhelmed. Sometimes you wonder, where do I even begin and, and, and what, am I, what am I even supposed to be aiming at in this process of spiritual growth? I think sometimes it's easy for new Christians to struggle with that. Somebody who, is, who hasn't been raised in the church, somebody who has just now become a Christian, they just learned the truth about salvation, and so they start coming here, and they start learning with us, and they know that as a Christian now, my life is supposed to change in some ways. I need to stop drinking and and stop cussing, and I need to stop being sexually immoral. But beyond that, we're not really sure what to aim at or what to look at or where we're supposed to start. What do I start doing? What do I work on first? And I don't think that's just hard for new Christians. Sometimes I think that can be hard for more established Christians, this process of spiritual growth. You know, it's funny the way it works sometimes. We, if you're an established Christian, you come to church often, you come to church on Sunday morning and you hear a lesson and the preacher gives you what? The preacher gives you three points of application, right? That you're supposed to take home and apply to your life. And then on Sunday night, you come back and go to Bible class, right? And in your adult Bible class, what does your teacher give you? Five, I can't, Five different things that you're supposed to do. Five different applications from the text that you talked about. Then on Monday morning, because you're a good Christian, you turn on a spiritually themed podcast, right? And and in that podcast, you learn about six different ways that you're supposed to grow spiritually. 
And then you go home and talk to your wife on Tuesday, and she pulls you aside and says, hey, the, here, here are two things that I really think you need to be working on. And that whole time you're reading your Bible that week, and during that time you got four different takeaways from your Bible reading. And so by the end of the week, before you even know it, you've got 20 things to work on. That's a little overwhelming, isn't it? What am I supposed to focus on? What am I supposed to aim at? How am I supposed to get all these 20 things done? Because guess what? Sunday's coming again, and the preacher's going to once again give you what? Three more applications that you're supposed to make to your life. Can't it be a little complicated? I think teachers, preachers, elders, and parents struggle with that. Not only thinking about their own spiritual development, but thinking about the people that have been trusted to their care. When I'm raising my kids and I want them to become Christians, where do I even start when it comes to teaching them the Bible and showing them the kind of person that they need to be? And maybe older Christians struggle with that too sometimes. Certainly it's not true in all cases, but maybe this is something you've struggled with as an older Christian, that sometimes you can grow accustomed to a certain lifestyle, a certain worship pattern, and you kind of know what you know, and you do what's necessary, you do what you ought to do, but there, that, that, that desire to dig deeper and to really grow and flourish, it's not really there. And maybe part of the reason for that is we're not really sure what deeper looks like. I'm not really sure how I'm supposed to grow after all these years in Christ. And so this process of spiritual growth, it's difficult, complex, overwhelming, daunting sometimes. What am I supposed to be doing? Where am I supposed to aim? Now, I'm certain that this isn't the only answer to that question, but I believe that it is a good answer. It's the answer that Peter gives us in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. He says this, Now, for this reason also... Applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self control, and in your self control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter writes to these Christians and he says, look, if you want to know what to aim at, if you want to know what to focus on, if you want to grow spiritually and develop the way that you're supposed to, here's what I want you to do. I want you to focus on adding these seven qualities to your faith. And not only focus on adding them to your faith, but once you have them, once they are yours, focus on always getting better at them for the rest of your life. Let them be yours, and let them always be increasing. Brothers and sisters, you want something to aim at. Aim at this. And I feel really confident making that suggestion to you this morning. Because this suggestion, these qualities, they come with three wonderful promises. You saw two of them in 2 Peter 1 and verse 8. Peter says, look, if these qualities are yours and these qualities are increasing, if you focus on growing in these things, then they will render you neither useless nor unfruitful. If you want to make sure that you are a useful, fruitful Christian, then what you need to do is focus on adding these seven qualities to your faith. You will never be useless. You will never be unfruitful if you are focused on these things. And more importantly than that, he tells us in verse 11, for in this way the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Jesus says, if Peter says, if you add these seven qualities to your faith, if they are yours and they are always increasing, if you focus on this, then you will enter the kingdom. You will go to heaven. And so, brothers and sisters, if you want to know, to, know what to aim at, if you want to know what to focus on, focus on these seven qualities qualities. And for a few moments this morning, let me run through them with you and show you what Peter means when he talks about these seven qualities he wants us to add to our faith. The first thing that Peter says is, to your faith, I want you to add moral excellence. The original Greek term there for that word moral excellence is, is the word arete. And that is a word that describes the pursuit of 
of excellence. And so what Peter is saying is that within every single Christian, there should be this desire, this determination to do this Christian thing to the best of our ability. Christians are not the, people, are not the kind of people who settle for spiritual mediocrity. We strive to, as we've been talking about this year, bring our best in everything we do. The words of Paul here are fitting. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24, he says, Do you not know that all those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And that's the idea of moral excellence. That's the idea of arete. We are the kind of people who in spiritual things, we run to win. I have a little experience with, uh, with running races. I've run some 5Ks and some 10Ks. And uh, I've noticed in my time that there are always two kinds of people in those races. And, and you know, if you've ever run one of those, you know what I'm talking about, right? Do you have your serious group? Right, and that is the group of people who are there who, if they don't want to win the thing outright, they are there to compete with themselves. I am here to run as fast as I possibly can. And so when they get to the end of the race, they are totally spent. They are huffing and puffing, and they're checking their times to make sure they hit the mark they were looking for. They are the serious group. And then you have the rest of the people. All right, those are the people who come to the 5Ks dressed in funny outfits and tutus and stuff like that. This is the... This is, I'm not going to say the non-serious group. This is the group that comes to have fun, right? They're running the race because they want to enjoy themselves. And so when the race begins, they're not nervous and they're not hardened. They're smiling. And when the race starts, they settle in and they run at an easy pace. They work up a little bit of sweat. They chat with their friends and they cross the finish line smiling. Look, no judgment if that's how you want to run a 5K. That sounds like fun to me. But the point is, that's not how you walk, your Christian walk. That's not how we live a life in Christ. Paul says that in Christ, we run this race like we want to win. And so, brothers and sisters, you want to focus on something, focus on that. You want to aim at something, aim at that. Making sure you are the kind of person who never settles for spiritual mediocrity. But Peter understands that this desire for ex excellence it's no good by itself because it could lead to bad places. Zeal needs to be contained and restrained by knowledge. And so Peter says to your moral excellence, I want you to add knowledge. Now understand, this knowledge that he talks about here, this is not just knowledge of random Bible trivia. It's not like Peter's saying, look, if you want to add to your faith, you really need to memorize the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, and you need to know the kings of Israel frontwards and backwards and know how to spell all their names. He's not talking about just learning, how to, how to, just learning the raw information of Bible stuff, which is valuable. It has its place, but that's not what he's talking about here. Peter's talking about the kind of knowledge that Paul talks about in Colossians 1, verses 9 and 10, where he says this, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Peter says that we as Christians need to understand what God's will is for our lives. And that means this knowledge he talks about is not just absorbing information or learning a cool mnemonic device so we can remember who the 12 apostles were. This is understanding what he really wants from me in my life. Understanding how he wants me to live on Monday morning. Understanding how he wants me to operate within my marriage. Understanding how he wants me to raise my kids and how he wants me to uh, teach others about him. Understanding what God really wants from me. That's the kind of knowledge we need. And that means that if we're going to add this knowledge to our faith, it's going to take more than just set aside, setting aside time to read the Scriptures. It means we are going to have to learn to have the humility to truly open up our hearts. And when we read what the Word says, and when we come across a passage that challenges us to change the way we're living, we have the humility to open up our hearts and accept it. Add to your faith knowledge. You want something to aim at, aim at that. Trying always to better understand what God wants from you. But knowledge is nothing 
if we do not have the power or the strength or the courage to act on it. And so Peter says, to your knowledge, you need to add self-control. Growing spiritually requires that we strive to submit our desires and our lusts to the will of Christ. Brothers and sisters, Christians are the kind of people who control themselves. And if you want something to aim at, if you want something to try to grow in and develop in, you need to aim at that. You need to focus on that. I am going to take my desires. I am going to take my lusts. I am going to take the things that my body wants to do, and I am going to submit them to the will of Christ. I think all of us can grow in that regard. Of course, we all know that's easier said than done because we've all got our demons and we've all fought those battles against ourselves. We fought battles against anger and bitterness and addiction and lust. Self-control is tough. In fact, it's so tough that if you ask some people today, they just tell you that it can't be done. It's, it, you just can't control yourself. No one can really expect you to control yourself. But the promise of the Scripture, the promise of Peter here in this verse is that this quality can be ours. You can submit your desires to Christ. And as a Christian, you should strive to do that. And the reason why we do not give up in this pursuit to control ourselves is because we hold on to the promise that James offers through the Holy Spirit in James 4 and verse 7 where he simply says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Brothers and sisters, you want something to focus on, you want something to aim at? This week in your life, resist the devil. Stand against him. Submit your desires to God to his law, to his will. Resist the devil when he tempts you to go out of bounds. And in this way, we add to our faith. Peter adds to that. And he says, to your self-control, you need to add perseverance. You know, as we walk with Christ, our life in him should not have flashes of self-control followed by devastating failures. Our life in Christ should be characterized instead by consistency. And it seems to me, unfortunately, that a lot of times my life is characterized kind of by that wild fluctuation. Have you ever found that to happen in your life? This month, we're absolutely on fire for the Lord. I'm evangelizing. I'm cutting out the bad habits. I'm cutting off the bad influences. I'm not watching anything bad on TV. I'm not listening to any bad music. I'm cutting off the friends that are bad for me. I'm praying three times a day. I'm reading my Bible every single morning. But what happens after a month of that sometimes? Those habits, those good things, they tend to dwindle away, and we kind of fall back into that sinful rut. I see a microcosm of this every year when it comes to my daily Bible reading. I try to, try to read through the Bible every year using the Bible app. And, uh, and if you've ever used the Bible app, then you know if you get on one of those yearly reading plans, you'll open it up and it'll show you how many days you're behind. At one point this year during the summer, I think, I think I was 28 days behind. Uh, and that just speaks to how, you know, sometimes we get on a good path. I was really good for like the first four months. And then we kind of dwindle off and trail off, and we lack that consistency, that perseverance to stick with it. I'm only, I think, seven days behind now, so I'm catching back up. That's something that happens in our lives. And Peter says that as a Christian, what you need to focus on is trying your best to eliminate those wild fluctuations in your faith. We need to be people of perseverance, people of patience. Our spiritual lives should not be characterized by flashes of spiritual brilliance followed by devastating failure. They should be characterized by loyalty, devotion, and steadfastness. That's what perseverance is. It is that consistency, that quality of being rock solid and immovable despite the changing conditions of life on earth. So if you want something to focus on, you want something to aim at, aim at that. In your life, strive for more spiritual consistency. In your life, strive to be a person who more patiently endures trials and temptations and problems. Be that kind of person that is rock solid and immovable. And Peter adds to that next. 
He says, in your perseverance, you need to add godliness. And I think it's important that godliness adds perseverance. If you notice, all of these qualities, they kind of build on the next one. But I think if you're going to have perseverance like that, if you're going to stay steadfast and immovable no matter what through the storms of life, then, then it depends on you being a person who is characterized by godliness. It's going to depend on your attitude. It's going to depend on how you look at God. And that is what godliness is all about. It's all about our attitude toward God and toward religious things. Godliness is not as I have always assumed, God-likeness. That would be a really easy definition, uh, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. The idea here of godliness in 2 Peter chapter 1 is more closely akin to the idea of a person who is God-oriented. You might describe this person as pious, religious, or reverent. This kind of person, the godly person, is somebody who takes spiritual things seriously. It's interesting to me that all of those three words, they carry a negative connotation in our culture, don't they? You use a word like pious or religious or reverent around regular people in the world, and it's almost going to make them cringe. We have a visceral reaction to those words because in our mind we get images of hypocrisy and spiritual corruption and all kinds of things like that. But what that term really means, it just means that you take God seriously. You're serious about Him. You are serious about His church. You are serious about the fundamental aspects of religion, like worship and assembling and prayer and partaking of the Lord's Supper. You are the kind of person who takes these things seriously and devotes yourself to them. You are a God-oriented kind of person. The godly person is the one who believes and accepts the words of Paul in Romans 11 and verse 22 when he tells them, Behold then the kindness and severity of God. But to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. That's what the godly person understands. That God is wonderfully kind, but he is also a God to be taken seriously because there is severity to those who fall away from him. And so, Paul, Peter says, if you want to add something to your faith, you want something to focus on, focus on being a godly person, someone who takes God and spiritual things seriously. He adds to that in the following, in the following one. He says, add to your faith, add to your godliness, brotherly kindness. That's one that doesn't really require much explanation, does it? He tells us that we ought to grow in our love for one another. That we are supposed to love the people that have been saved by Christ like us. We are supposed to love the people who are part of this spiritual family like Nathan talked about in his communion meditation. And this command is, is all throughout the, the ministry of Jesus. In John 13, verses 34 through 35, Jesus says that this is going to be the defining characteristic of his disciples, that we love each other. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That is our defining characteristic, the love, the passion that we have for each other. John would later write in 1 John 4, in verse 20 and 21, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. One of the most fundamental, consequential aspects of your life in Christ is not just how you treat God, but how you treat your brothers and sisters in Christ. You want to grow? You want something to aim at? You want to know what God wants you to focus on? Focus on growing in your brotherly kindness. If you want to grow, read this. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures 
all things. You want to grow, you read that passage, you read that definition of biblical love, godly love, and you ask yourself this question. How do my relationships need to change based on what I just read there? How can I love my brothers and sisters in Christ better than I already do? But of course, that kindness, that love that we have for one another, it does not merely extend to those who are in this church. Our compassion should extend to every soul that we encounter. And so, Peter concludes his thoughts by saying, to your brotherly kindness, I want you to add love. And that is love that extends beyond these brethren and to every single person. And so, again, you want to grow spiritually, you want to focus on something, you look at that definition of love and ask yourself, not just with my brothers and sisters in Christ, but to any person in my life, how can I love them better? Sometimes, Spiritual growth can seem daunting and confusing and overwhelming. And in those moments, what I encourage you to do this morning, brothers and sisters, is to go back to this passage and consider what Peter writes. And focus in your spiritual life on adding those seven attributes to your faith. And I think, I think the reason why these seven qualities are so important why they're so valuable is because what all of them call for is, is a fundamental transformation of who I am. This isn't just some uh, a tip that I might give you in Bible class about how to have a better prayer life that, that, that just requires a, a tiny little adjustment in the way that you go about your day. These are fundamental, monumental, transformative things that we are being called to do. We are c called to be the kind of people who do not settle for spiritual mediocrity. We are called to be the kind of people who care not just about what we want, but who want to know what God wants from us. We are called to be the kind of people who don't just do whatever feels good, but truly strive to, strive to control ourselves and submit ourselves to the will of God. We are the kind of people who persevere, who stand up and stand fast and stand immovable even when life gets hard. We are the kind of people who don't come to God with a flippant or irreverent attitude like most of the people in the world do, but we take Him seriously and we approach Him with reverence. And we are those who live in a world where it is so easy to hate. We are those who truly love our brothers and sisters in Christ and truly love everyone that we encounter. These qualities call for a fundamental transformation of who we are. These qualities make us less like the world and more like our Savior Jesus. And so remember, brothers and sisters, that when we add these qualities to our faith, the promises that he gives us, you will never be useless, you will always be fruitful, and you will, if they are yours and are increasing, you will enter the kingdom of heaven. As we said at the outset of this lesson, spiritual growth sometimes can seem overwhelming or complicated or daunting. But becoming a Christian is surprisingly simple. And maybe that's what you need to do today. Maybe you don't need to focus on adding to your faith because you don't have your faith yet. Maybe you don't need to focus on improving your walk because you haven't started walking with Christ yet. The Bible tells us that if we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we can repent of our sins that caused Him to go to the cross. We can confess our faith before men, and we can be baptized in water to have our sins washed away. We can rise to walk in newness of life, and we can begin this process of spiritual growth with one another. If that's your desire, and we can, we can help you with that, if you come to the front while we stand and while we sing.